One other area where I think um, AI is pretty interesting is for decision making. So have you seen any uses of generative AI for decision making? Yeah, there's some really cool things going on in generative AI right now. A lot of discussion about agents and agentic behavior. Um, you know, we're working on the continuum of simple agents to intelligent agents to self-replicating agents to polymorphic agents, which is really cool stuff. You know, right now, you know, early days when when I'd see people go in and use a, a large language model, OpenAI, you know, Mistral, whatever they were using, they used it very much like a search engine. What's the capital of Singapore? Well, we know it's Singapore, but... You know, they would ask, you know, what's the capital of North Dakota or what's the capital of New York? And and that's a, that's not really that's a search engine. You don't really need a large language model for that. So we have people using them in very simplistic ways. You know, they send in a prompt to get a response. But those the models really offer a great deal more capability and functionality than that. I saw one of our groups write a prompt that was it, it stretched the, the model at the time, the context window It would be easy to do now but it was a set of entire financial statements that were made up. And they had made them up in a way that there was mistakes, there were you know, outright errors, there were misrepresentation and gross fraud. And when they ran it into the model, it found all of it and came back and said, well, these numbers don't add up and this, this is not the right accounting treatment and this looks like it's suspicious, and, you know, the transfer pricing and different things like that. So, um, you know, the the... The, the future of large language models is more in the line of automated intelligence and decision making. So trying to bring it back and land the plane and answer your question is that, you know, we are going to a point where simple things like deciding, should I fly on the 6 a.m. flight or should I fly on the 820 flight? We won't make those at all. Our agents will do that for us. You know, we'll give them all the rules and the parameters and the the top line of what we want to spend and when we want to get out of bed and all the other rules. And we'll code those into agents and they'll go into large language models. And you'll go in and say, hey, I need to fly from Chicago to New York on Tuesday of next week and return on Friday. That's the last thing you'll say. The whole thing will be booked for you. So, you know, those agent infrastructures are moving in a way that simple, repetitive decisions will be taken care of for us. Now, some people are kind of wigged out about that. And they say, well, geez, you know, there's going to be a lot of jobs and there's going to be people that lose their jobs. Yes, that is true. People will lose their jobs. But the, the upside is that the jobs that we will be creating with the augmentation of intelligence is that they will be more fulfilling jobs. They'll be more interesting jobs. They will be jobs that pay better. So just like we went through transitions from horses to automotives to, you know, manual labor to industrial labor. We're going to go through a transition that is going to be focused mostly on white collar work where the, the lower end repetitive stuff is going to go away and the higher end, more sophisticated work that we as humans are better at, creativity, intuition, and you know, all those things are going to be more enriched. Okay. Uh, so that's really interesting though. The- Two very different examples there. So your first example was around being able to critique a large document and just come up with intelligent answers to that. And the second one's more about um, automating away um, uh, boring (laughs) manual tasks, like which flight should I pick and uh, going and booking things. Okay, so um, that's that's pretty interesting that those different examples. One thing I'm also interested in is um, around uh, other types of AI. So I know you're a big fan of causal AI. And actually we had... um, a guest on a previous show was saying generative AI isn't what you want for decision making, it's causal AI. Uh, so I don't know whether you have an opinion on this on one versus the other. Well, I do have my book on causal AI just <laughs> over my shoulder. So, you know, <laughs> I do have an opinion, of course. But uh, yeah, I think generative AI is good for simple decision making. Like I said, do I want to go on the 820 flight or the 6 a.m. flight? That's a simple decision that generative AI can make for you. Um, more, more complicated decision-making, you know, I, I, that's not really what generative AI is there for. You know, I'm writing my fifth book right now, which is focused on, um, causal AI, foundation AI, and generative AI. And the way I see that 
coming together is we're going to have composite applications of all three AIs working together. Now, causal AI is very good for understanding what's the true causative factors. You know, you always hear about this, that, you know, there's firemen around fires, so firemen start fires. <laughs> that's, no, that's not it. You know, of course, you, know, you want to get to the true causal factors, and it's hard for people to understand causality. We understand it in the abstract as a conceptual framework. We've been discussing it since Aristotle, so I think we've got a pretty good idea of what it is. But as far as modeling it and mathematically understanding it, we haven't been very good on it. Now, the interesting thing is, is that generative AI, having ingested the, the entirety or much of the internet and the corpus of human knowledge, has all the information about causality as well. So one of the things generative AI can help you do is generate causal pairs. So you have a better, more reliable set of causal pairs that you can feed into causal AI. Now, what does causal AI do for you? It mathematically, thanks to Judea Pearl and his all the people he's been working with over the last 30 years, gives you the new calculus where you can actually mathematically understand X did cause Y. And Z was a confounding factor. So you now understand this at a very detailed level. So you can go in and say, okay, let's understand what is the price at whereby people in this demographic buy one of these and which price causes them to buy 10. So you really can understand causality in a very detailed, mathematical, proven way. So I believe that we're going to have causal AI to give us that. We're going to have traditional AI to predict how many of these people are actually going to show up and do what we expect them to do. And we're going to use generative AI to generate treatments and interactions and invitations and incentives to give to those people to make them do what we want them to do. So I see causal, foundational, generative, all working together as, as one system. 